Um, okay, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Elizabeth Borer. Dr. Borer received her undergraduate degree from Oberlin College, which I put in there because it's a Midwestern state and a cool college. Yeah, called yeah. Nothing Midwest. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. And she got her PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara, which I don't know how you get a PhD from that place because I definitely <laughs> it I would have not time for graduated <laughs> if I had tried to do that. <laughs> She is currently the McKnight University Professor and Wardle Chair of Microbial Ecology in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. She's an ESA Fellow, a AAAS Fellow, and a Fellow of the Le Leopold Leadership Program. Um, Dr. Bora pioneered how to, in, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> Dr. Bora pioneered how to do inclusive bottom-up experimental research via her directorship of the Nutrient Network. I think this is a really, really exciting research program that she's built over a number of years with collaborators from all over the world. How many people do you have? Like, how many countries? I don't do you have how many people. Know? Yeah, like 29 countries. Yeah, 29 so countries. Like 160. Two sites. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like <laughs> unbelievable numbers of researchers that she corrals. And, and like these days, you might be like, yeah, sure, everybody does that. But it's actually a tremendous amount of work. Even just corralling the data I have found from 20 sites is a tremendous amount of work. And doing it from that many places is astounding. So she's pioneered not just interesting work in that area, but also how do you do these sorts of things in a way that allow you to push science forward. Her research program explores how environmental change um, <coughs> controls grassland and biodiversity, species interactions, and ecosystem function, and affect microbial communities within hosts and across landscapes, including disease transmission and risk. She explores questions and interactions over time and across scales in a way that no other experimental ecologist does in the United States or the world, I think. Um, she's a phenom. To underscore this, most people, when you say things like, oh, they have like 20 papers cited over 100 times, she has 16 papers that have been cited over 400 times and two that have been cited over 1,000. Mm -hmm. I will also end by saying that her schedule filled faster than I've ever seen anybody's schedule here fill ever, to the point where people were emailing me grumpy about the fact that they could not get on her schedule. It was like, <laughs> your schedule was filled in like five minutes. You can all come run with me on Saturday morning. <laughs> it's true. We will be running at Lil Park on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. if you would like to join us for a 5K. We. <laughs> um, anyway, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Borer, today's speaker, because um, she's incredible. So thank you for coming to speak with us. Okay, now anything I say is going to be a disappointment, right? <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thanks for the invitation. It's so fun to be here. Um, and I've had a blast meeting with everyone that I met with this morning. And sorry if you didn't make it on my schedule, but everybody that did make it on my schedule has been super fun to talk to you. So. Thank you. Um, and I look forward to more, <laughs> more of this tomorrow. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the Nutrient Network, but I'm going to start maybe, uh, there we go, with a little vignette. Um, I had the opportunity recently to take some ninth graders out into the field with me. And they knew they were going to you know, learn something about global change, which to them is like climate. And that was all they knew. <laughs> and I had them stop at the beginning of the field, just as we were coming into this meadow. And so I said, what do you see? And they said, trees. And then they said, birds. <laughs> and I was like, OK, what else do you see? And they're like, well, I think I see a deer in the woods, which of course, you know, <laughs> all the kids look to see the deer. Um, and I said, what about you know, over in the rest of what you're looking at? And they said, well, there's not really much there. And one very brave kid said, grass? <laughs> right? And, and I, I've tried this since then. It really struck me that we see the above ground world, but we perceive nothing there in the rest, right? So if it's, there's not a structure in front of us, there's nothing there. And I've tried this with adult groups. I've tried it with some of my colleagues. Um, and they know that the right answer is a grassland, but they don't know beyond that what, what I'm hoping they might answer. Um, and I think this is more deeply cultural. It's actually shaping how we think about our world and even our policies. So I had, again, a recent experience where I was on a panel 
discussing nature-based solutions. All right, so nature-based solutions. The idea behind this is that we have this massive biodiversity decline that we're all deeply anxious about, or many people <laughs> are deeply anxious about. At the same time, we have rapidly changing climate on Earth, right? And the idea of nature-based solutions is, hey, cool, we have a tool here where we can preserve, protect, restore biodiversity, and at the same time <coughs> have one of many tools to capture and store carbon, right? So at the same time, we can have solutions to these major global change problems, right? And these can become something that governments can fund and get behind, right? And so, you know, like the bond challenge, I don't know how many of you guys know about that, but it's this idea that we have um, lost forests and we have degraded lands and the idea is that governments are investing massive amounts of money to restore areas to forest. So there are just huge forest planting projects that are being invested in with under, you know, this, this name of nature-based solutions. Um, but it's led to all kinds of other challenges, particularly in grasslands, which historically have been perceived as nothing there or degraded, like it should be a forest. But there are a lot of grassland areas on Earth that are grassland, are maintained through fire, through climate, through soils, for whatever reason, vast areas that should be <laughs> under climate and soils grassland, and yet we're putting trees into them. And so, you know, it's almost like this whole crazy backwards solution <laughs> to restoring diversity while actually reducing some of the diversity on Earth. So I've seen this coming into this policy perspective as well, as there's nothing there. Those grasslands, there's nothing there. And so I'm just going to speak for the grasslands for a little <laughs> bit here. <laughs> um, they cover about, well, 25 to 40 percent of Earth's terrestrial surface, depending on who you ask and what you include, um, but a lot. Right, that's a lot, regardless of whether it's 25 or 40 percent. They also can be incredibly diverse. So they can be single species, monocultures, but they can also be like the Tibetan Plateau has 40 and more species in every square meter. They can be fabulously diverse as systems, of, sorry, species of plants um, per square meter. Whoa. About half of Earth's soil carbon, so you can do the math, that there is 25 to 40% of Earth's surface is covered by grasslands, but about half of Earth's soil carbon is stored under grasslands. In uh, temperate systems, it's about 300% more carbon is stored below ground than above ground in grasslands, right? It's astounding amounts of carbon below ground. So when I look at a grassland, I see what is there, but I also imagine what I cannot see. And so I think about that plant diversity, I think about that diversity that comes, um, comes together to capture sunlight energy, right? Capture carbon from the atmosphere and turn it into energy that is available to support all other life on Earth, right? Without plants, so photosynthesis is magic, I'm just gonna you know, put that out there. Um, because of photosynthesis, right? Plants are able to capture carbon in the atmosphere and turn it into energy that's available to us, right? So I see that as well. And then I imagine below ground, right? A lot of that carbon gets pumped below ground through roots into the <coughs> soils, feeding microbes, turning into soil, rich, fertile soils and storage of carbon. So I think about these as deeply interlinked in grasslands between the you know, plant diversity and carbon and a whole lot of other things that are going on in these systems. When people, <coughs> colleagues, actually that panel that I sat on, think about diversity in these systems, they're often not thinking about plant diversity, but actually thinking about animal diversity. In the past, 150 years, which is, yes, it's longer than our lifespans, but it's not that long. In 150 years, we have lost enormous areas that used to support the 250 or so species of ungulates on Earth. 
they are now restricted to a handful of locations. They used to be vast herds in North America, the Eurasian steppe in vast areas of Africa, right? They're now restricted down to areas that still have large grasslands persisting. So our ungulate species on Earth, broadly, that diversity depends on having large grasslands. While less visible, there's also a massive diversity of arthropods. And, you know, they're beautiful ones. I took that photo, that's why there's not a photo credit there, I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but massive diversity of arthropods, and we're seeing arthropod declines, right? So there's, there's these linkages between habitat loss, conversion, maybe planting trees, um, that leads to unexpected or maybe unanticipated outcomes, or maybe anticipated, but maybe people don't care. Um, but I would say, for me, I see an enormous amount of diversity, not just of plants, but also of the consumers they support. Now, I know it's unusual to put some data in your intro, but I did it anyway. So what are you going to do? Just go with me. So these are deeply interlinked. This is work from Cedar Creek. It's been shown in lots of other places at this point, but this x-axis here is planted species richness, not observed. So it's a treatment. So plots were planted with different numbers of species. On the y-axis, what we find is that with more species of plant, we have more energy capture, more biomass of plant. Right? OK, that's not a new result. But one thing that we found is we asked, OK, are we getting this wrong because we're not thinking about the consumers in this system? If, for example, in monoculture, consumers, some specialist herbivore came in and ate all the plant, <laughs> that could be that the consumers are driving this and not just plant diversity and function and ignore all the consumers. In fact, what we found is that there's about a 40% increase in plant biomass when we remove the consumers from that system. So out in this field, Cedar Creek in Minnesota, when we put on fungicide, soil fungicide, insecticide, or foliar fungicide, what we find is when we remove those above ground consumers in particular, the foliar fungi and the insects, we find 40% more mass. And it's proportional. So in those low diversity, low productivity plots, we find about 40% more is just not much. And there's 40% more in those high diversity plots. And that's where we start to see that difference. We can really visually see that difference in biomass. But if I turn that around and I think about that from a consumer perspective, what that shows me is that 40% of that energy that's captured from the sunlight that's supporting food webs, that is what's supporting all of the food webs, all of the consumers out in that field. Right? And we found this again and again. So um, when we fertilize, we see about 40% of that mass consumed by herbivores. When we put up fences, again, 40-ish percent of the mass, about half of that mass of plants is being consumed and supporting all of the rest of us, <laughs> all of the consumers. And interestingly, this is um, structural equation modeling. <coughs> I'm not showing you my full meta model, and I'm not even really going to tell you much about the experiment, except that in those plant diversity plots where we manipulated diversity, we do find more mass. There's a positive relationship here. And in my structural equation model, if I ask, what's more important, the diversity of plants supporting a diversity of arthropods or the mass of plants supporting more arthropods? Once I include the mass, diversity, diversity, or feeding specialization drops out. And so we find that mass link, that amount of plant energy, as a key link supporting the diversity of the food web. Taking that even further, that mass of arthropod could be because we have a whole lot more bugs in diverse plots or high biomass plots, or it could be because we have bigger body size animals. And in fact, what we found is that across that plant biomass, there's no relationship with the abundance of animals in a plot. In fact, what we see is a turnover, a compositional change toward larger body-sized animals. 
So grasshoppers, uh, leaf hoppers, and other organisms that are larger body size. So we're seeing a turnover, a compositional turnover, supporting a different group of animals in those high diversity, high biomass plots. OK, back to my intro <laughs> with pictures. Um, this is a grassland that most people would agree. They would look at that and they would say, there's something there. <laughs> right? We've done a thing. We're using it. Right? It's supporting agriculture. Um, and so this is an enormous change that humans are making on every continent in our grasslands. But there are other more subtle changes that are happening in grasslands as well, not just the restriction of where they are and the um, impacts. Uh, but we see these other impacts coming into uh, grassland, natural grasslands. So for example, nitrogen and phosphorus doesn't just go into the agricultural areas. It spreads out into, you know, through the nitrogen going up into the atmosphere and coming down in natural systems. We've seen a 400% increase because of the Haber-Bosch process since 1950. Which, again, that's a long time ago, but it's really not that long ago. <laughs> um, a 400% increase in nitrogen being produced and coming into ecosystems. We're changing the, the identity and density of herbivores on every continent. So we have cows displacing elk. You might not be able to see that. Sorry, they're tiny. They're displaced. Um, but on other continents, the exact same thing is happening, right? We have a very narrow range of domestic consumers, herbivores, cows, sheep, goats, yaks, right? Wherever you happen to be on Earth. Those are displacing a vast diversity of other herbivores, other consumers in these systems. Elk, kangaroo, kudu, reindeer, trying to think around my continents, <laughs> right? At the same time, we also have changing climate. And I didn't have a picture of a rainstorm. It's not so effective for showing <laughs> precipitation changes. But we have changing precipitation, changing temperature, and that is changing conditions on Earth. We are heading toward, in general, a warmer, drier planet. And that is the environment in which grasslands arose. They are more resistant to fire. And so when we take each of these at the scale, sort of human scale, and then um, show that at the scale of Earth, you can see that these are vast effects. It's not just one farm making these choices. It's not just you know, these specific things happening in one location. These are around Earth but they're not happening all at the same rate. They're not happening at the same time in each location. But that raises questions for me about what will future Earth look like? Where are we headed and how will this system function? So when and where will herbivores or fertilization, right, those two, how will they change? How will they control plants, carbon? consumers and how will climate impact that so I have many questions I just listed out my first couple of questions but I'm filled with questions <laughs> if you met with me this morning you know that <laughs> um, you know how will this depend on climate and so now I'm going to take a little segue I'm going to step aside and think about how do I answer a question as an ecologist for me I'm a field ecologist and I go out in the field. Like, that's my corner. I'm like, I'll start here and I'll start looking at the world, right? I go to the field and I set up an experiment. I'm like, okay, what if we push the world in these different directions? What does it look like? How does it function? And so, for example, let's say I have a plot here and I fertilize it. And it's like, you know, I, I compare it to a control plot, right? And you can see. It's greener, it's dense, more densely populated. If I go and I crawl around in that plot, maybe I'll find a different composition of plants. Maybe I'll find a different diversity of plants in those plots. You know, maybe I set up fences and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, what changed and what didn't? And then, of course, I think, great, that's how the world works, right? This is what the future will bring us. Okay, and <laughs> um, now I need to. <laughs> unload my concerns on you, things I worry about, so a little therapy session here. Um, 
my question to myself is, can I scale up? Can I take what I learned in that one meadow, and can I know something about what will happen in your meadow? <laughs> can I know about what will happen at some other location on Earth? So I'm working under one set of conditions. One location, you know, these are just two examples of many, many differences. There are evolutionary history, there's differences in soils, there's so many differences, and differences in trajectory of change at each of these sites. So I only have one, you know, realization, if you think from a statistical perspective, of <coughs> what that future might look like. So what we need to do is replicate it around the world. <laughs> This started as um, a very small project, actually. There were going to be about six of us doing it, and then we told our friends about it. And I'm happy to talk about it later, Q&A, or even better, over beers. Um, <laughs> it grew. Um, and I think it was filling, uh, filling a, a, a need within the ecological community, one where we're seeking generality, understanding about global change, and feeling like we can only do it in one place. How do we learn about the world? And so. These are sites, the dots here, where we're generating identical data to study the world. But it also represents people. And the diversity of thought in this group is so exciting to me. And again, I'm super happy to talk about that um, during questions and answer. But I feel like that is as much of the impact is because of the different ways of thinking um, and different environments that people come from, and so the questions that they even think are important to ask. Um, so this is the project, and in numbers, we have 162 sites um, on 28 countries, spanning all continents except Antarctica, and yes, there's a grassland growing there. If you know anyone who works there, let me know. <laughs> um, 131 degrees of latitude, right? So from Tierra del Fuego to Svalbard in Norway. Um, at this point, we have up to 16 years of data. Different sites have added in through time. So we have um, greater spatial extent and less temporal extent across this entire data set. We have about 4,200 plant species. And it's not <coughs> just a collection of who's there. It's a collection of who's there and how do they respond to different environments. So it's more than a flora. It's actually experimental um, responses, or responses to experimental treatments. And what kind of blew my mind when I finally decided to go on, I don't know, Wikipedia and figure out how many actual plant species there are on Earth. <laughs> uh, then we have somewhere, depending on what your estimate, I did more than Wikipedia, I still did. <laughs> um, but we have somewhere around 1.5% of Earth's estimated non-tree vascular plant flora in this. So again, not just where are they, who's there, but how do they respond to future environments? And to me, that's pretty exciting. We're starting to capture across phylogenetic lineages, et cetera. Um, yeah, so if we want to sample future Earth, what are we doing? How are we creating those environments? Well, we have three data sets that we're generating as a group. One is observational data. So just going out and sampling identically was new. <laughs> Right? It gives us information that we've never had, or information in a form that we've never had that's directly comparable across sites. We have multinutrient, uh, a multinutrient experiment. So we have nitrogen, phosphorus, and then potassium and micronutrients <laughs> are my three treatments. And those are combined in a factorial combination. So we have an eight, eight total plots, uh, or yeah, eight total plots of that. And then what we call a top-down, bottom-up experiment. So we have fences where we are removing the consumers and either adding or not adding all of the nutrients. So we take advantage of two of the plots of the multi-nutrient experiment to generate a fully um, additional experiment. This is replicated at most sites three times. So there's minimal replication within a site. The idea now, you have to sort of transition your mind, now a site is a replicate in this experiment. OK, so we have a lot of data. <laughs> what are we doing with all this data? Now I want to tell you some stories about nutrients and herbivores and how they might come together to inform some of these potential for nature-based solutions in grasslands. All right, so there's a whole lot of different um, 
relationships among these data, right? And I'm not going to give you one big structural equation model that looks like this and then be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll walk you through several different uh, results. But the idea here is that there are many different relationships and we need to try to tease them apart. So for example, if I add nutrients into a system, maybe I'll get more plant mass growing, right? <laughs> We've satisfied ourselves with agriculture that that works pretty well. We can pretty much grow more plants if we fertilize them. But that might change, for example, the light conditions underneath the plants. And that might then uh, reduce the germination of little plants, right? Because it's too dark, they don't have enough light, uh, which might then impact diversity. Or there may be direct impacts of diversity on, sorry, of uh, nutrients on diversity. Likewise, herbivores may be able to come in and consume some of that biomass, right? So we have hypotheses a priori that we can test. What I've just described is actually several different lineages of ecological theory. And I'm not gonna go into the math, but I'm happy to <laughs> later. Um, but it's really, we, we need, because it's such an enormous data set, we need to go in with a priori hypotheses because hunting through this data set is just, not viable, <laughs> nor would it be fun. Um, okay, so what do we know? I'm gonna give you a walk through uh, a variety of different response variables. So I'll start with plant diversity because that's where nature-based solutions begins. What we found is that when we fertilize, so that's nut, <laughs> nutrient, uh, we find a s consistent loss of species, about one and a half species per square meter uh, in plots around the world. So consistently we're losing species. We don't see an overall effect of fences, which had me a little stressed because I was the person that thought that putting fences up around the world would be really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what we do see is a consistent loss, not just of species, but of native species. So when we subdivided the data into native and non-native, what we found is that those nutrients are suppressing, we're losing native species. That leads to many other questions like why? Talk about that if you want. Um, but what we found very consistently with the fences is that where fences reduced light at ground level, so putting up a fence, removing the herbivores, it gets darker under those plants that are growing. In those sites, that's where we lose diversity. And so it's really a trade-off of, you know, nutrients, herbivores, light, right? So it's about resources. How do the herbivores interact with resources for the plants? And consistently, we found it was those little native species <laughs> that are being lost and that the non-native species don't respond really at all. So those herbivores are mediating diversity and composition in the plots. Okay. We push this even further. Sorry, I should be telling you who these people are. We push this even further. Um, Jody Price and Judith Sitters led this. Um, just came out fairly recently. Um, asking about what is the effect of the herbivores in where there's an evolutionary history of grazing, and when grazing is a new phenomenon with large um, ungulate grazers. And what they found is that in sites where there's a long evolutionary history of grazing, whether we have fertilization or not in those plots, we see a loss of diversity. But in those sites where grazers are relatively new on the scene, so short evolutionary history of grazing, we don't really see a loss of diversity. And it's, again, the native species that tend to be lost in these uh, sites with long evolutionary history of grazing. And so the grazers can maintain not only diversity, but also maybe species that we want to conserve in those systems, the native species. Okay, diversity, I wanted to come back to that. We looked at this across time, right? We didn't know whether you put fertilizer on and you just like lose it and then it sits with that same amount of diversity forever. Actually, what we found is that's not the case. We found that when we put fertilizer on across a decade, we continue to lose species. 
So there's a continual species loss. Each of these lines here represents a different site. The black line represents the mean effect across all of the sites. But it's not like one loss and then done. You know, It's not like there are some crummy competitors and they just lose. We continue to lose more species with more a like, longer duration of fertilization. So it's not it's not fast. Like we yeah. Okay, putting those two together, or actually putting the diversity into context, um, here's the change in species richness with one nutrient added, so either nitrogen or phosphorus, for example. Two nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, added together in a plot, or three, we've got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium added all together. And what we see is with increasing numbers, that's not just time, but increasing numbers of elements added, we have a loss in richness, but we also see an increase in the total mass in those plots. So at the same time. So let's transition over to think about some of that plant mass, that energy capture. So I was very relieved when I found that putting up fences around the world, despite all that variation, <laughs> did in fact lead to more plant mass inside of the fences. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, so all of the people that put up fences around the world maybe didn't hate me quite as much. <laughs> um, and what I showed you before in that last slide is that when we fertilize, we get more mass. We found that with the fencing effect, it happens rather quickly, so in the first two to four years, and then it's fairly persistent through time after that, up to a decade. What we found with the nutrients is somewhat different, that we see increasing mass through time. and um, They're not significantly different, but I will Check, check back with me in about three years <laughs> when we add the next dot on here. Um, okay, but what this experiment allows us to do is something really unique. Each of these sets of dots here, blue, yellow, and black, represents a site. So we can start to understand where, <coughs> under what conditions, when do we see these effects and when don't we see these effects? And that's really new. And what it allows us to, so these, uh, each line represents the difference from control at each site. And all of the dots represent um, a mean at a site. And what we see is that at low soil nitrogen, so relatively infertile soils, Nutrients, whenever you add nutrients, whether there are herbivores there or not, adding more nutrients into areas with low, low fertility soils increases the total mass. However, at sites where there's high fertility soils, adding more nitrogen doesn't have as much of an effect. So you see this sort of constant effect here in the presence of herbivores. But when we fence herbivores out, that's where we see the big effect in these high fertility sites. So it's high fertility sites where the herbivores are having a much bigger impact on that plant community and low fertility sites where fertilization itself is controlling in the presence or absence of the herbivores, controlling that plant mass. We also found patterns across mean annual precipitation here. So at low mean annual precipitation, we found differences such that the herbivores are reducing the biomass, the fertilized biomass, in the low precipitation sites. So I suspect that, and again, we're <laughs> following each of these things through, trying to do the next study. Um, I suspect this is related to plant chemistry. So there's growth dilution up here, such that the more nutrients you give the plants, the more <coughs> they grow. Um, down here, you give them more nutrients and they store more nutrients. They're more nutritious per plant. Uh, for those herbivores. And so the herbivores are having that big impact at low precipitation. The plants don't grow back as fast and they're, high nutri they're uh, highly nutritious. Okay, what about soil, right? So moving through from the herbivores to the soil, soil carbon. This is a study that was led by Tom Crowther and what we found in this is that regardless, so each of this, the x-axis is just the sites and rank order of just the impact, the effect on soil carbon. The y-axis is the change in soil carbon with all of those nutrients added. 
You can see that blue dot with all the nutrients added, sorry, with the nutrients added, the blue dots rise to the top in basically every one of these sites. Those are the sites where we're storing the most soil carbon. So adding nutrients increases the soil carbon storage. But herbivores play a role here. Again, this is work led by Judith Sitters. Um, and what she found is that under those fertilized conditions, that Crowther et al., the conditions there, when the herbivores are removed, there's less soil carbon. That's reduced. I suspect, and again, you know, this is sort of next steps, that that's being stored in the plant mass. It's not being recycled as quickly. It's in the above ground mass. Um, same thing is happening with the nitrogen here. It may be soil microbes. It may be the plants being compressed down to the soil. There are lots of hypotheses here. Right, so on those, but, but that we're getting less storage of soil carbon in the absence of herbivores under these fertilized conditions is an important observation, especially if we're thinking about wanting to maintain soil carbon under future conditions. Okay, now let's think about other responses, other, you know, nature-based solutions are intending to kind of solve everything, which would be great. Let's think about what we can solve here. Now I want to look at invasion resistance. That's something that a lot of people are very concerned with. What we find is that the nutrients reduce invasion resistance. Sorry, right, there we go. Um, the, this is barely suppressed here with the native species with the nutrient added. But what we see is this huge effect um, on exotic species. So the cover change, basically these exotic species massively increase in their cover over the plots. Uh, they come to dominate. In the uh, with nutrients added. <coughs> okay, what about other functions? Let's think about antagonism and mutualism. I had a great conversation about soils this morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> Looking around the room. Um, what we see is with so again control nitrogen phosphorus and then the N and P. And this is looking at soil microbial using metagenomics soil microbial communities. We see no change under nitrogen or phosphorus added, but when nitrogen and phosphorus are added, we lose mutualists. We see that widespread loss of mutualists from the plants, so the um, AMF fungi. Um, at the same time, under these same treatments, in these same plots, in the soils, we see a gain in pathogens. And so there's this shift from mutualism to antagonism with increasing numbers, possibly identities, of nutrients. All right, what about the bugs? Because who doesn't love bugs? Um, what we find is that that mass of arthropods, wherever we add nitrogen, we see an increase in arthropods. So each of these is in the multi-nutrient experiment and in that top-down, bottom-up experiment. Wherever N has been added, we see elevated mass of arthropods. We don't have great data on the diversity of arthropods yet, but if you think bugs are cool, <laughs> come join the party. Um, we can send you samples. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that one yet, and I don't know the answer to body size yet, but I can at least tell you that from that intro, structural equation model that we found at a single site, we're seeing similar effects of biomass on arthropod mass, uh, plant biomass on arthropod mass. All right, that's a lot of data. <laughs> so I just, I have some words here to tell you what I see. So if I were to pull that together, what I see is that we can, herbivores can help maintain that plant diversity through increasing light at ground level, for example, um, especially in areas with an evolutionary history of grazing. Nutrients can cause really long-term diversity <coughs> losses and continuing losses through time, but it's complicated, right? Because if we're thinking about nature-based solutions and we want to maintain diversity and store carbon, nutrients also lead to increased soil carbon storage. 
So we maybe, maybe can't get both. Maybe we can. And I would argue that plant mass, that plant mass is controlled by nutrients. Sorry, stepping back. Right, and the herbivores. The herbivores can help maintain that plant diversity and the sitters at all papers showed that when the herbivores are in the system, they also help maintain soil carbon. So it may be that we're missing a piece when we're trying to restore and store carbon and have diversity in these if we're not paying attention to the herbivory. Plant mass is controlled by nutrient in low fertility soils, but not high fertility soils. That's something we couldn't have known if we hadn't done that, done the same experiment in a lot of different sites. And the nutrients increase invasion, and they support more consumers. And I would say that we often think of these as bad, right? But I'm not gonna judge them. It's just a change in the food web. We're supporting more consumers, right? So if we're adding nutrients into these <coughs> systems, what we're seeing is we have increased invasion, probably a different mechanism underlying that, but we're seeing a change in the consumer community. They're getting more nutrient-rich, more <laughs> plant. Um, so pathogens and arthropods. All right, so now stepping way back, <laughs> I hope that you walk out of here not ever seeing a grassland as nothing there ever again. <laughs> um, if that's all you walk out with, that's great. Um, because I, I see this pervading our conversations about policy, about decision making, you know, like it's, it's cultural. It's more, I think probably even deeper than that. But yet in grasslands we have deep, rich carbon storage, it is protected carbon, unlike forests. Check out California, Canada, I don't know. <laughs> We're burnt most recently, right? That carbon is stored in trees, but it's, it's susceptible to fire in a way that the carbon stored in grasslands is not. That carbon storage arises from, in many cases, rich, diverse communities of plants that together can create and store that biomass. Those plants, again, they burn, they're like, bring it, you know? Like there's, <laughs> grasslands evolved under fire. Um, and finally, in addition to that, I would say that one thing that we're seeing is that herbivores are a deeply important part of maintaining the functioning of these systems. We don't want to get rid of all the herbivores. In fact, they play a key role. But we need to be aware of where and when and under what conditions they will help to maintain the carbon, maintain diversity um, in these systems. And so by gaining an understanding of the context dependence, the contingencies across environments, we can make much more informed or we can more uh, with it in a more informed way include grasslands in our understanding of nature-based solutions. So uh, with that, I will stop and in chat. <laughs> one more minute here and thank these awesome people. So uh, Eric is the person that I co-lead this network with. We were sitting at the table and dreamed it up together with a couple of other people, um, but we have maintained all of the data since then. Uh, Peter, Ashley, Eric, and Lydia have been the uh, part of this entire uh, thing. They have been the postdocs who have been in charge of all of the data wrangling, all of the people wrangling, developing databases, maintaining contacting people, um, they're incredible partners in this. Um, and then this is just one example of people from all, all of the different continents that are represented in the network um, coming together in Minnesota, and that's where the magic happens in coming up with what's the next question we need to ask and analysis we need to do. Okay, with that, sorry. <laughs> Great. Now you can ask. <laughs> we have time for questions. I'm gonna pass you the microphone. Yes, thank you for a great talk. Uh, going back to your very, very beginning where you uh, were saying that the knee-jerk reaction is to plant trees instead of grasslands, 
is it generally known, it's, or it's not by me, but uh, whether forests or grasslands in aggregate would sequester more carbon? I mean, just, just looking at it from a uh, structural standpoint, I could, I mean, the, the, the trees have much more mass and leaves, but then the grasslands are so much more dense, so there seems to be sort of a yeah. com competing factors there. Yeah, so there's rates and there's pools, right? So <laughs> um, the, I mean, grasslands, in terms of pools, store enormous amounts more underground. Um, so in a protected form. So I would just, as we're thinking, as we're planning out in the future, but you're asking um, so much of a question. There's, yeah, it depends on where you are on Earth. The grass, is, so there was a paper that just came out that um, did some tracing of carbon and found that the grasses are actually contributing far more to carbon storage in savanna systems than the trees are. Um, it depends on where you are on Earth, where there's more carbon stored in the plant. I mean, the plant above ground doesn't store a lot of grasses. Um, that's not what they're investing in, right? So I don't know if that's answering what you're yeah, asking. Yes, OK, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> The other side of the Sorry, room, first. <laughs> Pass it down. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay. Um, so when you mentioned that um, if you are seeing plant losses in areas that have an evolutionary history of grazing, which species are disappearing? Are, you, you said the native ones, but are those species that arose with the, the arrival of grazers, or they have a different history there? Yeah, so that's the next paper, <laughs> and I don't know the answer yet, uh, but we're subdividing that again to ask, uh, using phylogenetics to ask about, you know, who is where, when grazers arose, <laughs> basically, uh, who being the plants, like which plants were present in these locations when grazers arose. So, yeah, defining what is native and what is not native is a whole academic argument. <laughs> um, that gets really challenging, but yes. So I suspect that it's it's more about um, stature of the plants than it is about the you know, how long they've had this relationship. But I don't know. Okay. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Um, I have a follow up that's related to that, but first I have an extremely important question, which is: Do you say mutinet or not? <laughs> this is like my most important question. It is up to you. Oh. Oh. All right. <laughs> what do you say? What do I say? I say nothing. Oh. And the, yeah, all right. So <laughs> when this started, it was just a handful of us being knuckleheads sitting around a table drinking coffee and saying, oh, what's not in the world yet? Boy, this is really frustrating. How come, you know, how come scientists don't do their science the same way, right? We were doing meta analysis. It was super frustrating, right? Because it's hard to disentangle um, the biological from methodological. This, I'm getting, I'm answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we decided that, you know, we dreamed this whole thing up and they were like, oh, if we do this, we'd be nuts. Oh, that's hilarious. I'm Peanut, you know, like I'm Almond. And I could tell you who those people are. I was Nutter Butter. Um, right, so that's where Nut came from. But, you say what you want, and colleagues who feel very comfortable saying no, dad, and they want to say new, dad. I'm like, that's good. <laughs> okay, well, that that was definitely my you? most important question. Yeah, that's right. Um, but also, yeah, like that same result is like my brain is having a hard time with the response to herbivores, and especially with the longer evolutionary history. Yeah. Which then I think makes me wonder. I know you said you don't like have the herbivores fully characterized for all the sites, but like generally, who are the herbivores, and yeah. is there something in that that might help explain that? Yeah. So I mean, <coughs> these are these are non-agricultural. We have some with cattle, but for the most are cattle and yaks and sheep. Um, but for the most part, these are the native animals. And are they system. how big are so, the fences? Like, are little things blocked out? By your fences? So fences are um, um, not tall. <laughs> They're this tall um, with, the, <laughs> with the wire mesh uh -huh. um, and 10 centimeters flanged. 
out and stapled down to the ground to keep out rabbits. We can't keep out fully fossorial mammals because there are a lot of restrictions on buried fence at a lot of these sites. And then above that, we have strands of wire um, in a standard fence that go up to um, two meters. At sites where there are elephants, there's an additional strand of electric wire around it because we discovered that elephants find it a great place to scratch their shoulders. <laughs> That's great until they collapse your fences. So um, there are modifications of fences um, in Switzerland and the Alps. They also had to use huge like telephone poles in the corner. Anyway, but it keeps out um, medium to large mammals. Smallish, the smallest mammals like grass mice, they climb grass, they're gonna get in. Um, so we're not controlling the littlest ones, but 50 grams up, so guinea pig. <laughs> really, we have a second of guinea pigs. The one in Argentina, like who knew there were guinea pigs out there? Anyway, um, yeah, so it's medium size. There are some sites with ungulates, and that's what's key here, is some of them are the hooved ungulates, and that's where, this is really, I didn't go into all of the theory behind each of these, but testing Milchinus and Milan Roth's theory of um, evolutionary history of grazing. And they are thinking specifically about grazers with hooves versus not. And so in Australia, there are no native grazers with hooves, for example. So that's, I don't know if that's yeah. helping yeah. get up. <laughs> We're just going to keep passing it yeah. And I and another question about herbivores, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, have you been able to assess the effects of insect herbivores or arthropod herbivores compared to um, vertebrate herbivores? Oh, yeah. And because <laughs> the biomass of the arthropods can be impressive. Yes. Um, what we found is that there is more insect herbivory so there's so many graphs I didn't put in this talk. You can just feel relieved about that. Um, but there's there is uh, biomass removal that is greater or damage. Sorry, in fertilized plots, and that is what is why I suspect there's a much greater mass of arthropods in those plots as well. But arthropods move. <laughs> um, one difference though between those two groups is the arthropods can move across the whole field. They are not bothered by fences. Right, right. Whereas the herbivore, larger herbivores are. And so we, the study is more strongly able to make inference about the larger herbivores than about the small right. ones. So we can observe them as a response, but not think about them as a treatment. I will talk since I have the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, so uh, the, the network spans a huge climate gradient. We look at the map, it's huge yeah. climate gradient. Yeah. And also some of the sites have 10, 15, or 16 years of data. So presumably there is a climate change that already happened. Do you see any response to the changing climate? Yeah, all right. So climate change, we often are thinking about something at 30, 40, year scales, and importantly, we're thinking about means. The annual variation in these sites and among year variation is so huge that I think we would probably need 50 years to pull out some of that variability, right? Because there's huge variability and maybe, you know, one year it rains in California and the next four years it doesn't rain in California, right? And so pulling out climate change per se is really tricky. Pulling out the effect of annual precipitation we're doing. We're starting to pull up, pull that out. But yeah, I mean, if you have ideas of how to really tease out like a changing mean from that background of enormous variation, I'm ready to talk. But I, I don't know how we could do that given the background of so much among your variability. But yeah. I, I would love to be able to do that. It would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you for a really amazing talk, oh. really fabulous. Thanks. Um, I just had a question. You know, when I think of, um, of grasslands, I mean, 
you talked about nutrients and you talked about herbivory. To, so to some extent, maybe my, my question is unfair, but when I think of, about grasslands, I think about fire, right? Yeah. And that's kind of like the gorilla in the corner you didn't talk about. So yeah. I, I was Isn't wondering. That fire picture? Come on. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just nodded at it. Right. Um, okay. So my, my question is, do you have any data or can you say anything about how frequency of fire, for example, affects um, species richness or about ability to store carbon underground, anything like that? Probably pulling data sets together. So these sites, I mean, like my site in California burned down a couple of years ago because that's what happens in, in California. But it wasn't a controlled, it wasn't a treatment. Right? It was just a, oh, wow, look at the news. That was our site. Um, you know, and then coming back to melted things in the plus. Um, so, but pulling together, but I, I think what you're asking is actually more of a long term question about fire history and fire frequency and possibly fire intensity. And that would be super cool. We could pull that, if there are data at that spatial scale, we could pull those data together with the soil carbon and diversity data that we have. The experiment itself won't, isn't set up to tackle that. But I will just put in a plug that when I think about grasslands, I don't necessarily think about fire, but I think about disturbance. So I think about wallowing or, I don't know, tilling <laughs> or, you know, pigs. Like they're spreading. They'll be here not too long. They're coming north. Oh, wait. <laughs> in your so anyway, um, so what that's, question? that's one thing that I think about as another huge force, and we have a new experiment. So if you want to join now, oh wait, you have <laughs> um, looking at disturbance by nutrients, trying to tackle that one. Fire, fire is so tricky to do experimentally well because it, the spatial scale of a fire and the intensity of a like, yeah, so. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about fire more. Like, we burn our plots at Cedar Creek every year, because that's our, every handful of years, because that's a natural process in that system. But it's not, it's just a metadata uh -huh. <laughs> sort of um, piece of data that we include. Yeah, it doesn't have that much of an effect on a lot of the plants. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch hate on that one for a while. <laughs> so one more question. <gasps> Oh, all right. I just have to let everyone know that this is my aunt who showed up. Oh. I mean, if you guys have your aunt show up, that's pretty awesome. But <laughs> and I had a nice conversation before. But I have an anthropocentric question. Okay. I'm talking about nutrient flow capture and flow and so on. Uh, did you, in your analysis, look at all which um, plants thrive? Are there any of them? preferentially edible ones, or ones that provide more nutrients to the cattle and potentially humans, like grains and so on, as opposed to just, you know, flowers and um, grasses and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, grains are grasses. I'm just going to start there. Um, <laughs> but um, under nutrients, generally what we see is a shift toward grassy species and a loss of flowering. In terms of edibility, though, I don't know that I could say something completely general across all these sites because I don't. I haven't. I don't know all the plants. I haven't. Well, theoretically, grains, you know, origin yeah. of rice and wheat and so on. Yeah. Are, you know, specific kinds of grasses. And so um. We have. We have species that are congeners, so in the same genus as crop species in many of our plots. And they tend to do fairly well. That's a big generalization, but under nutrient addition. Um, but we lose a lot of other things, right? So if, yeah, flowering species, but a lot of our crops require pollinators. So if we don't, if we lose those, that matters <laughs> too other parts of human um, survival. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have a general answer to that, though. Nice. Well, that Thanks was, for uh, coming. <laughs> Let's thank Elizabeth again. <laughs>